Hi, everybody. I'm Ronnie. Hi, and I'm Jenny, and we are... We are the Heart and Soul Sisters. Got that right. <laughs> <laughs> and today, um, we're talking to you about a book by uh, Bessel van der Kolk called The Body Keeps the Score. And uh, to me, it was a really exciting uh, book to come across because it's, it's really relevant to the kinds of things that you and I, Jenny, have been talking about. And, oh gosh, yeah. um, and to our own personal journeys, it's also really helpful in the, the work that I do in teaching my students um, because I teach in a program that's called Community and Behavioral Health. And so there's a lot of uh, um, obvious health implications to what he's talking about. So, um, yeah. so, so let's just dive right in, shall we? Hey, yes. um, so, so the basic premise of, of his argument or the, or the, the reality that he's, that he's talking about is that when people experience trauma, and it could be childhood trauma, it could be trauma through war, it could be a traumatic car accident, right? It could be a, a flooding in your community, whatever, some kind of trauma, um, that that uh, locates itself and continues to reside in the body, right? That we, uh, when people experience trauma, He's a physician, right? And he's, he's, he's done a lot of research um, out on the East Coast. I believe he's located in the Boston area. Um, that when people experience traumatic events, they, um, a whole lot of things. I mean, it's a very complex argument, but it distills down to this idea that, that there's this emotional and, and often physical pain associated with the trauma, and people want to shut that off Want to, don't want to have to feel those things, right? right. Uh, particularly emotional right. trauma, and that that ends up getting um, having all kinds of negative implications for their health, um, emotionally and physically and spiritually moving forward. Um, but in particular, what does it do to the body, right? This idea that that we take that emotional pain and it ends up getting stored in the body, and so the yeah. lot of people who are experiencing physical pain. Um, may be there a huge contributing factor may be um, emotional trauma and this isn't a, a a new idea right there's a lot of medical research on this um, for example they've long known that women who've experienced trauma from sexual assault um, are that there's a link between that and chronic pelvic pain um, you know there's all kinds of different ways in which uh, the body keeps the score, right? I just love the title of that because it does. Yeah. You think, you think you're, you're going to push it down. You're not going to deal with it. Um, you just kind of, kind of ignore it, make it, try to make it go away. Um, and the body remembers, the body knows. And um, so, what I was hoping that this would be is um, an invitation for people who might have, um, you know, some kind of chronic pain that they've been dealing with, um, to think about that possibility. Right, to think about the possibility that there's something that's been repressed, suppressed, something that's happened to you that may be um, helping to, that may be contributing to that, maybe contributing to that, that pain that they're feeling. Um, and, it can, and it can be a combination, right? It can be a combination of both physical and emotional trauma that create that. Uh, score that's kept in the body, that pain that's kept in the body. Um, I was going to say something else, but I lost it. Do you want to jump in? Do you have something you wanted to you say in response to that? Yes, I, yeah, <laughs> yeah, my life flicked off on me and it's like, oh, wait, it's what like happened? It derailed your train of yes. thought. I could see it in your eyes. You're like, wait a minute. <laughs> uh, that's all right. I'll just yeah. do it without it. Yeah, I want to, I wanted to, I just, I keep thinking about, because it really struck me, of course, um, because I know we've shared about our, you know, my struggle with depression and anxiety since I was a young kid. Mm -hmm. And when I read that, that part in the book where he talked about oftentimes children whose mother struggle with depression grow up with struggling with chronic anxiety. And I'm like, oh my gosh, because our mom struggled with depression. Yeah. And it's like, yeah. oh, this makes sense, you know, um, right. that that it would also trigger, trigger that in me and my depression that I struggled with for since childhood, um, and anxiety triggered anxiety in my poor children, you know, no matter how much, I mean, at least I, I, I did what I could to get help for it, um, with medication, with counseling, with, you know, I did everything 
that I right. could think of. Um, but it still affected my children. And, um, and also, you know, the, the physical abuse and the molesting issues in our family. Um, you know, I've lived with neck and back pain for a long time, years. Right. Since, right. I mean, I first started having neck and back pain. I think we shared in a podcast before when we were bringing in hay. And it was oh, like, and it, I, hey, yeah, I don't know if we told that story. Oh, did, eh, no, maybe? I don't think so. No, I don't, I don't know. But we, we were living on the farm and, mm-hmm. um, and we, we were help, help our neighbors clean and, their hay. And then, and I was, I was 14 and you were 14. I was not quite 17. Okay. Yeah. And we, um, we were unloading the hay wagon. That was our job to unload the hay wagon. And our parents and our brother were in the hayloft stacking all the hay. So we had to, 75 pound bales that we were pulling, pulling down from the wagon and moving onto the conveyor belt right next to the wagon or at the edge of the wagon to get back up there. Yeah. Yeah. And and our dad was up there yelling at us to move faster, move faster. Right. And so, um, so we did, we unloaded one hay wagon after another, the two of us. And, um, and we did a lot of heavy work. We did a lot of heavy lifting. And um, it, it was at that time when you and I both, I mean, I remember you, because we shared a tiny little room, you woke up and couldn't turn your head. And I couldn't I turn my so head for a week. I couldn't turn, I couldn't move my neck for a week. Yeah. yeah. And that was when you and I both started having, I think, those intermittent flare-ups of the neck and the back pain. Right. And um, it wasn't like we, I mean, afterward, there was, we would go to the lake and we would swim and there would be a release and a little bit of laughter of, you know, oh my gosh, that was so hard. You know, but in the moment... There was a lot of yelling and cussing and carrying on of, of and, rage, stress, you know? and stress and stress about stress. That trying was to our, keep up. Our, yeah, that was our, our our parents' way on a regular basis. It was an angry time, and so it was really interesting. As I, w- I haven't read the the all the way through the book yet. I'm I'm behind. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but I was really struck by how it was talking, uh, uh, how the author was talking about. Um, yeah, that the that the trauma, and he was talking about Vietnam vets and World War One vets, World War Two mm-hmm. vets. You know, right. Research he read from a physician that dealt with shell shock from the, the World War One vets, and how they all struggled with this explosive rage and um, over yeah. every little day things, and and it made me think of our parents because yeah. they both had obviously had trauma themselves. Yeah. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, and. And then how that how that carried, you know, how they perpetuated a lot of, and instigated a lot of that trauma for us, and um, yeah, and it just it really struck me how you know this is it becomes an intergenerational thing. Yeah. Uh, yes. Even even when for us even when we were very actively seeking healing and really actively working on trying to overcome the effects of the trauma it still affected our kids yeah and 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 it's really amazing now here i am in my mid-50s and i am probably because of the participating in the the walking and the hiking and the meditation and the and i'm really getting actively back into my yoga practice that that we'll talk about next time (laughs) <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll talk about next time. I know, I go all over the place. Uh, no, 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 I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, just just preview of coming attractions. <laughs> yeah, preview of the next the next talk. Um, but the yoga has, I, you know, I am, I'm feeling better in my body now than I did 10, 15 years ago. Right. Um, the neck pain, the chronic neck pain is gone. The low back pain is gone, um, and which was really debilitating for yeah. a number of years. Yes. And, and it, and it, it's all for me, it's obvious that it's all coming together from an energetic spiritual and healing and the physical healing is coming because of that, because of, right. Of the, the work I've been doing to address and, and, and funny, the depression and the anxiety has been lifted, you know, knock on wood. Right. I know. I, I, I can't, I can't remember a time since my first child was born that I haven't gone through regular cycles of it, 
of the depression and the anxiety. Um, and it, it's really amazing reading his book and how he, he talks about, about the, the working with the body. And he even mentions yoga. Yeah. As part of and well, he, so, yeah, Go ahead. I was going to say he started, he started a trauma centered, um, uh, a, a particular kind of yoga for people who have had a history of trauma because they're certain like because one of the things is that um you know it used to be that they don't do this now actually because of his work it used to be that they would teach you like when i did my training i was taught to do assists where if people were not quite aligned the way the posture calls for you would you know gently touch them and or ask right ask may i offer you an assist may i you know make an adjustment and then you could gently put your hands on them and say, you know, pull the shoulders like back like this or let the shoulder blades melt down the back kind of thing. Um, and now they're like, don't touch people, right? Because people with traumatic um, backgrounds, that scare the hell out of them to have somebody come up and touch them, you know, particularly if you don't ask permission. But even then, they might feel too frightened to say no. Like one of the, one of the key things about people who suffered trauma is they have to get control over their own body. Because one of the experiences of trauma is not having control over your own body. In our and case, we had physical pain inflicted on us that we could not avoid, right? We could not get away from it. We did not have a choice. It, it was just there. And it happened to us and, and, and Repeated. you, repeatedly. And you need Here. to be able to have control over your body. Uh, for some people, and the, the damage they got, they incurred physically, is so um, so severe that any form of touch is painful or is scary for them, right? So so um, um, his whole approach is about kind of befriending the body again. And for some people, it might just be stroking your own arm, right? Like trying to like feel like the the arm feel feel your hand on your own arm, and the arm feels the hand. Like for some people, they are so numb; they've had so much pain. They've had to just disconnect from their bodies, right? And psychologists talk about yes. how people dissociate. Like if they're in the middle of a, a physical beating or sexual assault, they'll just like have an out-of-body experience. And for yes. people who've been traumatized repeatedly, that might be a continuous experience. Like they live from the, the neck up, right? They live in the yes. head. They live in the world of mind and maybe some emotions like rage, like you were talking about, but not the full range of emotions, so they, they've, they, the way to protect themselves has been to make the body the enemy, to, to numb disconnect. themselves, to disconnect. Um, I definitely and so his, did that at times, yeah. Yeah. So his whole approach is how do you, for, first of all, a lot of people are not even aware. They're not aware of what they're feeling. So he talks about developing the skill of interoception, right? Be awareness of what's happening in your body. And so... And, and remaking that connection between emotions and the bodies because people will, will sever that to try to protect themselves. And so saying, okay, if you are experiencing an emotion like fear, which is very common with people who have trauma, it doesn't matter the source, fear is, is, is a big piece of it. Um, when you allow yourself to experience a fear, where do you feel it? And what does it feel like physically? For some people, it might be a clutch in the chest. For other, it might be you, you're like your hips contract and you just kind of crunch in or you feel your shoulders. I, I used to laugh that I wore my shoulders as earrings, you know, like they were way up here most of my life. And it took a long time to let it get them to slide down where they belong. And I could actually feel the physical difference in my body, both in my, my shoulders, like knowing my shoulders hang down where they're supposed to now as opposed to when I was in my 20s, but also my low back. I never had the chronic back problem that you had, but I had a lot of tension. And, you know, I've mentioned this before, you know this, I'm a fast walker. And because <laughs> yes. I have long legs, my legs are as long as dad's and he's 6'1", right? I got the same inseam as him, um, even though I'm only 5'7". Uh, so I have long legs and I've always had a fast stride. And I've discovered over the past like five years or so that is because I like clench my low back and I power forward with that stride and I've and I've noticed as I um, started to with yoga we're going to talk more about that you, you introduced me to some postures that were really uh, helpful with my back and hips and I've just noticed that oh when I walk now my legs swing from the hip sockets I'm not pushing myself yes. forward from my low back you know so it's, it's all of these things it's like just noticing what is happening in 
your body. And for some people, that is a terrifying proposition to yeah. start paying attention to what's, when I feel a certain emotion, where is it in my body? Because yeah. emotions, you can almost hold at arm's length, but once you acknowledge that it's actually in your body, yeah. that brings it very close, right? If you spend all your time trying to numb and try to separate and trying to push down those things that happened yeah. um, that, that it caused you to be so scared, um, yeah. that caused you pain, it, it can and be very hard. A lot of people are really not aware of what's going on in their bodies because yeah, of their I histories. Think, I think from my experience, I mean, in my late teens, I, I went through a period of anorexia where I just wouldn't eat yes. for a week yes. at a time, um, at, sometimes longer. I just lived on coffee. Um, so I, I think, and I, was, and I had a very controlling boyfriend at that time, and, yeah. and that was just, re, I think, reinforcing what I was struggling with with our parents. Um, and so, you know, I went through that episode of trying to kind of make my body disappear, I yeah. think, is partly what I was doing, just make my, try to make myself disappear. Yeah. Um, and other times, yeah, so there, I've gone through different phases of trying to dissociate from my body. And there certainly have been, have been times when I didn't want to be touched. I didn't want to, you know, um, it wasn't that I couldn't give my kids hugs and kisses and, you know, and, but my poor husband, you know, yeah, there were times where I just, I just, dis, I just despised my body. I don't know how else to say it. And, and I still right. felt so much intermittent chronic pain in my body. Um, I went through the chronic neck pain, the chronic low back pain. I, I have such a high tolerance for pain because of the beatings that we had as kids. Yeah. Um, and learn and learning to dissociate from the pain. Yep. And I think I shared, yep. I think I shared before about, um, at times not wanting to give in to our parents' rage, not yeah. wanting to give them the satisfaction of crying. When and they would, would beat go, us. Yeah. 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 So I would go numb and, and, and dissociate, um, which just meant that there were way more bruises and welts. Um, and, and it, it gave me a very high tolerance for pain. So I, I've, yeah. I've torn. I've torn my deltoid muscles on both sides multiple times. I mean, to the point where I had goose eggs because I didn't feel the pain at the time of when I was lifting something that was too heavy. Um, right. I've torn my bicep on the right side. I've torn my rotator cuff muscles on the right side twice um, and didn't know until I had significant bruising the next day. And it, obviously I couldn't move my shoulder and right. realize, dang it, I did it again. So, it, it has tremendous impact on your quality of life and your health when you go through this kind of severe trauma as a child or, or as an adult or, you know, I, I mean, the trauma can be any number of things. And yeah. it, it, it makes it very difficult to be present in your body. It makes yes. it very difficult to be aware of what is going on in your body and the years of, IBS and intermittent vomiting that I had that was, I'm sure, related to all of this, yeah. to all of the, the childhood trauma. Yeah. And it's amazing when you start learning how to connect in with your body, how to be aware of what you are feeling, of what food you're eating, how that's affecting you, and what relationships you choose to be involved with and how that is affecting you. Right. Um, sometimes just being present with people who are really toxic or just draining your energy from you. I, you can call, I call them project relationships. Um, <laughs> realize you realize I had a lot of them in my younger yeah. years. I, I got a lot of, um, I got a lot of, Oh, I'm a good person because I'm loving and I'm helping this person. And this person is sucking me dry. They're taking right. all kinds of energy from me and using me, but I'm such a good person because I'm giving to them. Right. And, and it, and realizing, wow, I have a migraine later <laughs> that day or the next day because yeah. I spent half the day with this person or I went out to lunch with them because they wanted to go out to lunch and, and they wanted me to be their counselor or they, you know, I mean, it was, mm -hmm. it's becoming aware of 
why do I have migraine? <laughs> what triggered this horrendous right. migraine? Right. You know, and and th- these are all just examples of how, you know, over the years I started to realize, okay, this is not, this is not healthy for me. You know, this is not helping me in any way. You know, I would, and so I mean, through the years I've I've realized that I would rather have one really good friend or two or three, you know, than to have acquaintances that really are draining and that, yeah. that, um, that I'm putting all the effort into the relationship or into giving and I'm receiving no love or support in return, you know? Right. Um, I mean, these are all just examples of, of by starting to be aware of your body, of how your interactions with others, uh, your work environment, your, what you're putting into your body, um, the level of taking care of your body, whether it's with daily cardiovascular exercise, with performing yoga stretching, meditation, um, it all helps, I think, connect us back into our heart, our body, our, you know, we, we're, we're, you know, you, you, you're, you can't live a compartmentalized life and be fully present and be, and be living a life of joy. Right. You, right. If you are living a compartmentalized life and you're living out of your head all the time, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's living a, a, a it's half living. It's living a partial, partial life, you know? Absolutely. Um, because, because if you, if you cut yourself off from the pain and the fear, right, if you shut down physically, you don't know what's going on with your, with your body, you're repressing those things. You don't have access to joy and creativity and curiosity, right? I mean, you, you, exploration. Yes. I mean, yeah, yes, right. you do, you just, you, you don't. So that's the, that's the motivation, right? That's the motivation to try to, um, move through whatever blocks you may be storing in your body because of your past experiences. And there's, you know, a couple of simple things that um, Vanderkolk talks about that, um, you know, anybody listening to this who feels like, oh, maybe I have made my body the enemy and I am kind of shut down, um, that the first one I mentioned already, just like, just like touching yourself, right? Just taking one hand and just gently, you know, stroking your own forearm. And can you feel the touch in both directions, right? Can you, can you feel the gentleness in it? Can you feel the lovingness in it, right? So it goes back to the heart and opening up the heart. Um, yes. the other thing is the breath. And, um, again, the book makes such a great point is that the, the breath is one of the few things in the body that is both automatic, but you can control it. Yes. You can bring your awareness to it. So for a lot of people, people who are, who have kind of shut down their body, who are living in fear, they're often very, very shallow breathers. They yes. just... Like they might use the teeny tiny portion of the top of the apex, lung, right? Apex of the lung yeah. only, right? right? Yeah, right. So that, yeah, medical terms. Thank you. So okay. that, um, so that just try, and for some people it's scary. Like he, he talks about this, um, trying to work with someone in, cause he's a psychiatrist. He talks about trying to work with a particular case, he does a case study and he talks about how we would spend like a whole session just trying to get them to breathe just a little bit more deeply or a whole session of just touching their arm. Like just trying to feel the, a non-threatening touch, right? A non-threatening touch. And so um, just trying to, just becoming aware of your breath. How am I breathing? Can I feel where the breath is coming in? And maybe you're not even trying to change it. Maybe you're just trying to become aware of it and say, where, where am I going? Am I breathing in the top of my chest? Can I feel it come down to the middle of my chest? Can I feel it come down to the bottom of my rib cage? Can I feel it come down and to my I belly come button? In. Can I feel it come all the way down to the below the belly button, the top of the pelvis, right? Like how, how deeply am I breathing? And then maybe over time, once you're aware of that, you might then say, well, can I breathe just a little bit deeper? It's a little safer. Cause, cause the whole thing is that we learn it's not safe to be in our body. Right. The body is a source of pain, whether it was a person who did it to us or whether it was an experience like an accident or being in, in combat or, 
you know, whatever, somewhere we learned it wasn't safe in our bodies, that there was pain there. And nobody wants pain, right? Nobody wants pain. Um, so, yeah, so it's, it's, um, it's just... It's just, I, I just find it a really fascinating book, you know, and, and th this whole idea of this, this, we have to be able to be in our bodies. If we can't be in our bodies, we can't live fully. No, we cannot fully live, exactly. And, and that's, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, if you, if you can't be in your body, if you can't trust your body, right, if you think your body is going to betray you by making you feel physically or emotionally, you know, things that are painful or unsafe, then... Oh, what a terrible prison that is, you know. Yeah. And it's and it's so common. It's very common. It's very common. But, but some, I, I think I think I would just like to say that you know, as I mean, somebody who was really struggling with my body, uh, accepting my body, loving my body, um, in my younger years, that with all the all the work that we've been doing together, you know, helping each other right. along in this. You can, you can heal this. Absolutely. I'm in, I'm oh, in, yes. I'm in such a different place now than I was 10, 20, 30 years ago. Oh, my God. And, and I'm so grateful. I feel like I say that every podcast. <laughs> I am. I am so yes. Grateful. Yes. I, I, because life gets, it just gets better and better. I mean, it really, really does. And I agree. And I, I, you know, I, back when I was running and, um, you know, gosh, what was that 15, 18 years ago? And, um, and just felt so fit. I still had so much, I mean, I had more energy, but I still had so much physical pain still. Yeah. And I, you know, I'm in a place now where I, I'm not living with physical pain every day. Right. That's huge. Yes. I don't take yes. any anti-inflammatories. I don't take any muscle relaxers. I'm not on any meds. <laughs> you used to That's take huge. them a lot. Yes, yes. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I used to, yeah, just to get through the day. Right. To, so right. that I could function. And I, I'm not on an antidepressant or, or an anti anxiety medicine. You know, um, there was a time when I was on a couple of different medicines one that, you know, helped me feel better during the day and one that would help me sleep at night. And, you know, I've never been on anything controlled because I, I wanted to stay away from that stuff. Right. Um, but right. I, I, I just am amazed that I'm living a life of joy and fulfillment and connectedness. Yes. yes. And with myself. You know, right. Not just right. with others. Not just, with, not just right. with my husband, you, your family, my children, but with myself. I right. used to be a person that wa that felt like I had to have distractions. I was. My friends called me the Energizer Bunny because I was involved in this and this and this and this and this. You and were I super busy all the time. Yes, volunteered, yes, yes. Yep. yep. Ran, yep. ran, 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 and go, 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 do, do, yep. do, do, do. Yep. And I, I still have that capacity. I can do that, but I'm not. I'm, I am, I am spending time with myself. I used to be afraid of being with myself, by myself. I crave. Alone time. And I <laughs> Leave love me it. alone. Leave me alone. I love Go you. Go away. <laughs> and I and I I love my alone time. I I love to read. I love to go walk with my dog. I love to meditate. I love to do yoga. And there's not enough time in the day to right. do and to do my soul level coaching and stuff that we've talked about and mm -hmm. and all of that. Um, there not there aren't enough hours in the day because I still work a full time job. And, right. You know, as a practitioner. Right. But I absolutely love my alone time and and I love and I, I'm I'm happy and comfortable being with myself and being in my body. And I just can't tell you what a game changer it is for me and for my contentment to day in and day out go to sleep at night and sleep soundly mm -hmm. and wake up in the morning and feel energized and ready to start my day and to live a life without pain in my body. It's, it's incredible. Yeah, it, it is. You don't, you don't realize what a shift, what a huge shift it is to be more, to be more fully present with yourself, with your heart, 
with your body until you until you've come through that I think or you don't know what you're missing until you until you see the healing in in the rearview mirror right um, yes. Because, you know, we, we say all the time, well, there's these, these inevitable declines with aging. You know, well, your eyes get bad. You know, I've got my little, I got my little cheaters here that are everywhere, right, yeah. all over the house. Yeah, but... <laughs> um, and, and, you know, I was like, oh, well, you know, you don't move as well as you get older. You don't this, you don't that. I'm going to be 57 yeah. in a couple of months, and I move better now than I ever have in my entire life. Yes. Because I, because I've, it's, and it's not just that I, I walk or I run or I practice yoga or whatever. It's also the spiritual work, right? It's also yes. the, the, as you said, being comfortable with myself, um, liking myself, accepting who I am, not driving myself to be perfect. I mean, all of those things create a whole different mood, a different energy to live in. And it's, it's just... It's really exciting. I plan to live a very, very long life. You know, Jim and I just celebrated our 35th anniversary a week or so ago, and I told him we're halfway there, right? We're going we're gonna to make it to our <laughs> 70th So because we got married young. Um, so, I, you know, I'm looking forward to even more miracles physically, you know, seeing what my body does as it gets chronologically older but doesn't necessarily break down the way we think of with aging. So it's really, it's, it's a really, it's an interesting experiment, right? <laughs> to it see, is. see it how, is, see, yeah. see the, what, what can we reverse? What can we release? What can we change? Yeah. You know, um, there's, there's so much, this, this body, this life has just got so much magic and wonder uh, in it. And we don't, I think many times we just assume that there are limits on what we can do. Well, we place those limits with our yeah. thoughts, with our feelings. We do. We do. We create a lot of those limits in our body. And, you know, I got to tell you, I, I just feel like it absolutely is getting better and better. And it's funny because, you know, I, I just look back even five years ago from how I looked, how I felt in my body five years ago and how I feel today. I mean... I had arthritis pain five years ago, such arthritis pain in my thumbs, in my wrists, in my knees, in my hips, in my back, in my neck, and it's gone. Okay. I, I have no problem opening up jars. I was, I was struggling <laughs> to open up jars for crying, no, jars of no. crying out loud. Really? <laughs> yeah. To get the blasted jar lid off. And, and I'm having no issues today. And yeah. so, there, there is absolutely something about our, our mental state, the thoughts, the, the chronic tape of thoughts that are going, you know, right, back right. and, and, and replacing some of those, some of those limiting, limiting thoughts with more loving thoughts, you know, and that, and that's all part of the mind, body, soul, heart, addressing your, yourself and your life and mm -hmm. the, the, the spiritual healing the emotional healing, the physical healing that comes from spending time with yourself, from nurturing yourself. Yeah. And it's not selfish. It is, it is an imperative in order to live this life to your fullest potential. It, and, and yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I want to cut you off. No, that's all right. And, and, and that's, and that's what we're talking about in, in these podcasts really is about, um, really embracing all of who you are and, and, and that includes embracing whatever past you've yeah. had right. and learning to, learning to love yourself more fully to learning how to nurture yourself in, in all levels. Yeah. And, and, and to me, the, the icing on the cake is that, you know, we call these, these things selfish when we take me time and we engage in self care and all those things, but that is the greatest gift you can give the world, the universe yeah is for you to be a centered, loving person. If I go out into the world as a loving human being, I can enrich the lives of everybody around me. If Absolutely. I go out as a cranky, tense individual, I drag Resentful, everybody down with angry, me. angry, yeah, sad yeah. person, then that, that energy, that heart energy is just being transmitted all around you. And it's yeah. impacting everyone around you. Right. And 
So there is a huge shift that will occur, not just in yourself, but in all the lives you touch. Right. You will see a shift in the attitude of the people you work with, of people you come in contact with or in the store. You, yeah. you, will, you will literally see and feel a shift because you are loving yourself more fully. You are meeting yourself more fully. Right. It, it, uh, it, we, w- how we love ourselves and how we meet ourselves fully and embrace all of who we are from a place of love and compassion transforms the world. Absolutely. It has ripple effects. It has ripple effects beyond our understanding. Because how we love ourselves is how we love others. Absolutely. Yeah. I don't think we should say anything else. Other than that, I, I think that's the best way to end. <laughs> I think you're so awesome, Ronnie, and I just love you. I love you too. This is this is so great. We still don't know what we're doing, but we're doing it, right? And we're, we're doing, doing it together. It. Figuring it out as we go. <laughs> and if anybody can learn anything from us, then that's just, that's the icing on the cake. Absolutely. So we're sending you all so much love. Very much love. Much light. And many, 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 many blessings. blessings. Yeah. May you find the blessings in connecting fully with your body and all of who you are. Yes. Until next time. Take care. Bye-bye.